Oh my goodness, it is so wonderful to be here with all of you today. I look around this room and I see people that I know, people who have been working on the issues around homelessness and housing in this community and adjacent communities for, I'm gonna say, decades. And I am honored to be here with all of you today. I wanna to start um, by expressing my thanks to Jordan and Cass for bringing us together. Um, Aura is doing an incredible work in this community. We'll have a chance to talk about that, yes. And the opportunity for us to come together to share our common experiences, our perspectives on this issue is really a building block to doing the work better and understanding where we need to go in the community. So thank you for pulling together the gathering. Um, how, homelessness and housing are increasingly an important part of my legislative portfolio. And I think that reflects um, conditions here on the ground. We are in a community that was housing burdened before we ever had a wildfire. And then in September 2020, we lost 2,500 homes. Not only 2,500 homes, that's bad enough, but of those homes, 1,500 were manufactured homes. We had 19 manufactured home parks destroyed or nearly destroyed where our most vulnerable residents and neighbors lived. Those people who are working people, our Latino Latinx families, our elders, and we saw in a moment what it is like to have 6,000 people um, out on the street without a place to live. So, how's it, so we understand this issue of homelessness and housing. And I wanna note um, that I think the angst and concern and I hope desire to act that brought us together in this room is shared by Oregonians across the state. When we do um, public opinion polls of the issues that worry people most, Homelessness and housing is always at or very near the top of that list. Now, the good news is that we have a governor, Governor Kotek, who is laser focused on this issue and was in her prior career as a speaker of the Oregon House. And over the past about five years, I think our legislature has done some very good work and we'll talk about that later in this presentation. But the fact is that you can have federal policy and funding and you can have state policy and funding but if you don't have local partners out on the ground, you will not have the outcomes that you need. And so, that's right. And so today, it's really about the big question in front of us is how do we meld resources that may be available at the federal level or resources that may be available at the state level to really um, set up the organizations and have the support so that we can provide programs and services that can be used by our homeless neighbors to stabilize themselves and move to permanent housing because to be very clear, that is the goal of all of this effort. So we're gonna try this and see if it works now. Great. So sometimes it feels like homelessness is a phenomenon that just appeared in front of us. Um, we know that's not the case, but I think it does feel that way sometimes because it is more evident on our streets right now. And frankly, a lot of us have just begun to pay attention to an issue that's been with us for, for decades and even probably for centuries. And like Brian, I think it's helpful to go back and start all of this discussion with a little view of how we got here because this isn't an overnight um, uh, experience. This is really um, a story of social and economic and political developments um, that helped to contribute to where we are today. And I think we look at the history and what has happened as a reflection of where we need to go in the future. So it's important to take a step back. So I wanna roll back um, even farther than indicated on that slide and take you back to the late 1800s when Portland and other urban areas across the country were really developing as cities. And in that effort, um, we had migrant workers who showed up in the cities. These were people who were doing essential jobs. They were longshoremen, they were loggers, they were warehouse workers. They were essential workers, but they were also very low paid, and there was not housing in the community that was accessible to them or affordable. And so the city, recognizing that this was an essential um, group of people and that we needed to take care of them, stepped up and they built single room occupancy hotels, sometimes known as SROs, and they built boarding houses. And they charged those workers 35 cents a night. The 35 cents a night um, computes to about $12 a night in, to, uh, in today's numbers, probably what we would expect someone at a very low income to be able to pay. That worked pretty well as the cities developed, 
those migrant workers either left or they moved in to become permanent residents of the new community. And the rooms that were in our SROs were really increasingly taken over by our impoverished members of the community, people who simply had no place else to go. And while an SRO is not a perfect place, um, it was home for many people and it was affordable for them as well. So that system stayed in place um, through the middle of the 1900s. And then we got to the 1970s and or, 50s and 60s and something called urban renewal. And that was post-war period when cities stepped up and they decided the old neighborhoods that had evolved from the city cores, these were the neighborhoods, by the way, that probably had the most heterogeneous population of any other places in the cities, needed to be modernized. And so in the cause of urban renewal, we went in and we raised many of those city core areas. And that meant that many of the SROs that were taking care of people that were home to our, to our most vulnerable populations um, were collapsed and disappeared in the process of doing that. It was in the pursuit of revitalized neighborhoods, um, but it was a tremendous cost to the people who lived in those neighborhoods. And then in the 1970s, as you just heard from Brian, we saw the federal government step away from the housing supports that had really been developed under President Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. I must say, Brian, it worries me when I hear you say that those checks that the state can now write are bigger than the checks we get from the federal government. There is something wrong um, with that kind of, of approach. So the federal government in the 1970s started stepping away from its commitment to housing. And then we got to the 1980s, and something else happened that didn't, didn't help things at all, which is that we began to dismantle the psychiatric institutions which had cared for our most vulnerable people, people with mental disabilities, people with mental, severe mental health crises. And we did that out of a good instinct. We know that large institutions are not perfect. We'd heard lots of stories about bad things that had happened in those institutions. And the intention was to move people out of the big institutions and into neighborhood-based um, residential care facilities where they could live and, and um, exist in the comfort of their own familiar neighborhoods. The problem was a lot of that development never happened. And so people who were moved out of the psychiatric institutions found themselves in many cases with severe mental illness on the streets with few resources and no ability to care for themselves. So then we get to the 1990s. Um, things are not going that in, in that good of a direction, and the 1990s continued that trend. When we saw a flood of heroin come into many of our communities, um, that instituted the war on drugs. The war on drugs um, served to disproportionately um, address and institutionalize in our prisons, especially black men. Um, the impact of that was to destabilize many black families. Um, when you lose your family um, core, you also lose another part of your safety net. Our families, strong families, are often the place that somebody in trouble goes when they're down on their luck, they've had a bad event. But if families are dispersed and not available, then that safety net um, is diminished. And that happened in, in large part in the war on drugs. So despite all of these bad social political upheavals, despite the fact that we didn't have psychiatric institutions, that we'd attacked families, that we'd destroyed safety nets, even 20 or 25 years ago, someone with very few resources and maybe someone struggling with other issues could still find housing. We back, roll back to the year 2000 and there were still crevices in our housing supply where people with few re um, resources could find refuge. And then we got to the 2000s. You will remember in 2007, 2009, we had a huge recession um, across the country. And it was at that moment um, that we really took a step back on the private sector's development of housing. If you lived in Ashland back in that period, you will remember developers who had really been helping us um, to, to, to build housing. They were the people we depended on to do this work. And they disappeared in that 2007, 2009 period. Some of them moved away. Some of them went bankrupt. Anybody who was carrying loans um, had a very hard time surviving during that period. 
And, and statewide, um, as a result of the recession, we really just stopped building very much housing. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, the lack of capital was an, an issue. The workforce was an issue. But this is true not only for um, our community, not only for the state of Oregon, but really a phenomena that we saw across the country. The, the particular exacerbating factor here is while we stopped building housing, we did not stop growing. Oregon was a place um, where people wanted to come. And in this 15-year period since the, rece the recessions um, began, we continued to see steady growth in Oregon. What does that mean if you're not building, but you're still growing? Um, as Brian noted, we now in 2024 um, calculate that our housing deficit across the state is 140,000 units. So what does that mean? That means if we had enough housing for everybody who's on the street and there was enough flex in the rental market so that if you, you needed or wanted to move an apartment, you wouldn't have to struggle to find another one that you can afford, or if you were a young family and you wanted to buy a house for the first time, you would be able to do that living on a median income rent. To, to accomplish all of that, we would need 140,000 more units than we currently have. So that was the setting when we went into 2020 and we had a pandemic. Um, and the pandemic, while the pandemic was very good for some people who had resources, the pandemic was extremely hard on our working families. Um, pushing people um, who very often did not have work to pay more and more of their income in rent or to make their house payment. The state poured hundreds of millions of dollars into rent subsidies because we understood this was a crisis moment for people. And still, the pandemic had the impact of pushing more people to the street. Where's my, here we go. So where are we as a result? Because of the elimination of safety nets, the undermining of families, the elimination of institutions, the lack of housing development, um, Oregon now has the fourth largest per capita number of homeless people in the country. Um, in the year 2022, which is the most recent really good data, we, th we think that about 18,000 people across the state experienced homelessness. We were first in the country in terms of chronic homelessness, chronic homelessness being defined as people who have been homeless for a long, as long a period as a year, or people who have had sustained periods of homelessness in their life. We also saw as the pressures in, in metropolitan areas intensified, um, that homelessness became an issue in our rural communities across the state as well. Again, using those 2022 statistics, um, in our rural areas in Oregon, we know that there were more than 3,000 people that year who had no home uh, to go to. And we saw an increase, um, and Brian noted some of this data, in our homeless family population of 27%. That is, of the individuals who report being in a family with children, um, about 3,000 of those individuals were homeless across the state in 2022. The lack of housing um, is clearly a pressure on anybody who doesn't have a home. It's also a severe pressure of people who are barely hanging on. The lack of housing um, undermines our ability to hire people, to develop our economy, to maintain diverse communities, and just to keep the people we want in this community housed and present here. So my, I have a wonderful chief of staff, I have to pause here, Paige Pruitt. If you ever call my office, you'll probably get Paige. Um, and Paige said, if you're going to use that slide, you're going to have to explain it because nobody is going to know what it is. <laughs> and she, of course, was right. She's right about most everything. But this chart still makes a really important point that I think is worth soldiering through, even if you can't see all the details of it. So it's a chart of three illustrating three different issues. The vertical axis on each one of those charts is the rate of homelessness. The horizontal axis on the first chart is poverty. On the second chart is drug and alcohol um, incidents. And on the third chart is medium rent. So you see on this chart um, that states are analyzed by their rates of uh, poverty in relationship to the incidence of homelessness the rates of drug and alcohol addiction, 
in relationship to the incidence of homelessness and the cost of rent in relationship to the incidence of homelessness. There is very little correlation. Um, if you look at the states, and this is 2019 data, so I recognize that it could be updated at this point. Came from the state economists, though, very good source of data. But there's very little correlation across the nation if, if you look at states that have um, high levels of poverty or high levels of drug addiction to the presence of homelessness. But look at the cost of rent. The cost of rent is connected to the issue of homelessness. And that seems intuitive and obvious, and yet it's worth um, reviewing because very often we know that people who are homeless come with a variety or struggling with a variety of issues. But in places where housing is more accessible and more affordable, even those people who may have um, struggles um, up in addition to their homelessness are able to find a home. That is not the case when you have a constrained housing market as we do here. So what is the state doing to step up to the situation we've got? Well, historically, I want to say, actually, we didn't do a whole lot. Um, when I got to the legislature in 2017, um, I think our budget for homelessness in the entire um, state budget was about $40 million. That's a chunk. Um, it's not a significant chunk. In 2018, Governor Brown, then Governor Brown, asked for $5 million to put into shelter statewide. That was really a landmark defining moment. That was the first time the state had really stepped up and said, um, you know, maybe local governments can't do all of this work by themselves. Let's put a little money in to support them. And we put $5 million into 2018. But the big change really came in 2020. And I will say that Project Turnkey, and I'm going to spend just a minute talking about that, was really the first big turning point. I want to call out Project Turnkey because there is a very definite genesis of this story um, to work here in Ashland. So back, way back in 2020, that was at the height or the beginning of the height of the pandemic, um, I was working with a number of organizations here in Ashland, including Aura and Jobs with Justice and Peace House and the Monday Night Dinner Crew, um, because we understood that it's hard enough to shelter in place if you are someone who has a home, and if you are homeless or your home is the watershed, it's going to be a very difficult experience for you. So we came together and we put together meal delivery programs to make sure that people could shelter in place, even at a campground, and to make sure that if they needed medical help, there would be eyes on them. And we did this successfully, and then we got to the middle of that summer when the pandemic, remember, which was supposed to be two months long, was still going. And um, the people at Aura looked at me and said, we're not going to be able to do the winter shelter program because throwing a mat on the floor of a church while it's better than nothing is not, was never best practice and is not conceivable during a pandemic when we couldn't have people near each other. And they looked at me and said, we really need to buy a hotel. And, and we'd had some good experience with that because we'd gotten money from the city of Ashland um, during the early days of the pandemic, had been able to shelter people in hotels for two to three weeks, and we saw that what that moment of stability meant for them um, was transformational. So I said, okay, hotel, we got to buy a hotel. And I, I joined with other people on the state level, and it turned out people were thinking about this all over the state because it just is what made sense. We were at a moment when we had a, during the pandemic, people weren't traveling. There were a lot of excess hotels that weren't being well used for the tourism industry, but that could make wonderful um, decades-long um, use as um, shelters or transitional housing. And we put together this project. We called Project Turnkey. We copied California a little bit. They'd already done it as well. And we asked the um, California legislature for $65 million in our beginning pot for the purpose of going to communities and helping them to buy um, hotels to transition immediately um, to shelter. There are many advantages here, one being the hotels already existed. We didn't have to go out and build shelters. And the second being we knew that that model of giving people a room and a door to close and a place to put their stuff um, made all the difference in the world in terms of their ability to cope with life. Um, it took a while, but we got in our first phase of Project Turnkey actually $75 million. Um, we were able to, through um, organization by Oregon Community Foundation, which managed the program, and that was an essential partnership, we were able to 
help communities buy 19 um, facilities across the state. And then, after we did that, I thought, maybe we should do another round of this. And I went back to the partners, and we all agreed that it had been a successful model. We should try again. And so we asked the um, Oregon legislature in 2022 for another $50 million, and we got that. And as a result of all of this work, and again, Oregon Community Foundation stepped in, um, we have been able to develop 32 shelter properties across the state in 18 counties, um, and we've increased the shelter bed capacity by 36%. So that's Project Turnkey. And I want to say um, it's important to note that Aura was the very first um, entity in line for Project Turnkey because we have people here who are thinking ahead, who knew what they needed to do, who were organized, who had identified the property, who had stepped up, and when we were ready to go, they were ready to go. So that Aura is, or is <laughs> leading the state. So the next, in the 2021-2022 budget, um, led again by Speaker Kotek and supported by Governor Brown, the Oregon legislature put $100 million of investments um, in navigation centers. Um, Medford got one of those. We put money into local government support and shelters. In 2023, um, Governor Kotek had become governor from Speaker, and she took that position just about a year ago, recognizing that um, she was going to put all of her might and all of her political leverage into addressing the issues of homelessness and housing. And very early in the game, she declared a state of emergency around homelessness on our streets. The legislature stepped up, and we put together a $200 million early session um, allocation. 150 million of that was directly for homeless services on the ground. Um, Jackson County got about 10 million of those dollars um, in that first allocation. The emergency order also included about 50 million dollars toward the development of permanent housing. There was a chunk in there for um, youth homelessness and there was 20 million dollars for modular housing development. I'll talk a little bit about that later. In the end, so that was early 2023 session. At the end of the 2023 session, in the final budget that would guide the next biennium, we put a billion dollars in new housing money. Um, that billion dollars um, will go toward, um, largely toward the development of permanent housing. Um, at the end of the 2023 session, we also put another $111 million into making sure that those services that we'd set up through the emergency order would have enough funding to actually continue for the balance of the biennium. And we put a relatively small chunk, but $24 million toward existing shelters like the Project Turnkey shelters to keep them going. I'm gonna pause here and just show you what it means to have an emergency order and some resources behind it. So with the emergency order, the governor's office set out certain objectives. You know, got, we, we wanted to see actual changes take place on the ground. And this graph and the actual numbers tell you a year later what we achieved in all of that. The original uh, goal of low barrier shelter beds um, was exceeded by 432 beds. The, that is a pretty incredible achievement across the state here in Jackson County. City of Ashen stepped up to acquire a facility uh, run by Aura, and Rogue Retreat is running a facility in Medford that will also qualify under those shelter beds. We rehoused 1,293 households, that is people who were on the street who were not in services were picked up, rehoused, and supported with enough funding so that they can maintain that housing over a period of time, also exceeding the original goal. And Eight, this may be the most impressive number. Um, nearly 9,000 households were prevented from homelessness, also exceeding the goal by 136 households. Preventing, no question that preventing house homelessness is the best and most strategic um, choice that we can make. And Jackson County and Aura outperformed. Later today, I think you'll hear something about the Jackson County experience. But note that we have um, gotten notice from the state and the governor's office because we stepped up, um, we stepped in, and we actually achieved the goals, exceeding the goals um, at a er very early point that we were asked to address. Mm -hmm. 
So we, can't, we can and must do all of this work around homelessness. We need to set up shelters. We need transitional um, services. And we need that navigation that's being provided by Aura so that when someone comes in, um, we can address the variety of issues that are, that are coming with them. Because as our numbers of homelessness increase, so does the breadth of the issues that the people who walk in our doors carry with them. And we need to be able to help them and offer them services um, whenever we can do that. But we also need to build housing because no, even if we can um, stabilize people, help them get on top of their game, if there are not affordable units for them to move into, a stay in a shelter means that you're back on the street when you have to leave that shelter. So this is probably the most important work that we do at the state, and that is really to boost our housing supply. The governor has set a goal, no, knowing that 140,000 deficit, the governor has set a goal of 36,000 housing units a year. Let me tell you, that's almost double what we have been producing, which is more like 18 to 20,000, so it's ambitious, it's also appropriate. Um, as noted, we put in the 2023 session a billion dollars toward uh, in new money toward this goal. That will go to lift funding, which is our primary source of funding for affordable housing. It'll go to permanent supportive housing, the development of home ownership programs, and then $100 million toward just essential programs that we have to have to keep people on the street. The $100 million also includes, by the way, one of my favorite programs, which is um, some money to help people who live in manufactured home parks when a park goes on the market to buy that park so that the park can be owned by residents. Um, <laughs> later, I want to note, if I have time, when we get done today, later today I'm going to an open house in Josephine County where we have the very first manufactured home park in Josephine County and maybe in Jackson County actually, uh, except Talent Mobile Estates is going to be uh, resident owned, that um, came on the market. The residents organized and with the help of statewide organizations have been able to transition to a community-based um, manufactured home park. So we have to fund things. Um, we also need to look at planning and land use considerations. As part of the emergency um, work that we did early in the last session, we also passed legislation that will implement something called the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis. That is a, an analysis that was conducted by Eco Northwest, an, econom uh, 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 an economic firm, um, that really helped us to understand how we need to shift the way that we think about housing. Heretofore, we have asked house, uh, local communities to develop housing needs studies. So these are often very complicated, dense analyses of the housing that we need. And we do those studies, and then they sit on a shelf, and we've checked it off. We're, gonna, we're shifting now. Um, we want to know what the needs are, but we also want to know what local communities are going to do about it. How are you actually going to step up um, to produce that housing? We are asking communities, and Ashland's already completed the process, to come up with a list of the strategies that they intend to put to work to actually make sure that we are moving from theoretical need to practical development of housing on the ground. So housing and land use is going to continue to be a focus of what we do. Um, clearly, money matters, workers matter, and the rules around where we can build and how we can build are an important part of this. And then I want to talk about innovation. And this is close to my heart because I come at this work from two perspectives. One is having worked through Project Turnkey where we figured out we could we didn't need to build shelters. We just need to think differently about how we use buildings that were already there. And I come at this from wildfire, where we have struggled to get housing on the ground even three and a half years after the disaster. So the question is, how do we do things differently? How do we think about how we produce housing in a way that can get units on the ground in a more affordable fashion? And we've been able to do a few things um, that I put in this innovation category. The first one was, in 2022, um, I championed a $15 million ask that went to St. Vincent de Paul of Lane County. St. Vincent de Paul is now building, and it should start operating within weeks or months, a manufactured home factory for low-income manufactured homes. Um, we need to go, that's right, we need to go upstream and think about how we produce housing. 
And I think it is not unlikely that some of those, man those units um, being done by St. Vincent could even land back in this community um, to, re to respond to our 2020 ongoing wildfire issues. In fact, they just let me know that one of the first models that's coming up, they want to donate to Jackson County because they know how much we need it um, and we, they know how much we care about manufactured housing. The second, so after we got the manufactured housing factory, I um, looked at the rest, I, I started looking at other ways that we can produce housing in a different way. And we, um, I was able to promote the $20 million um, allocation that I mentioned earlier that is part, that was part of the emergency order. So it's $20 million that we got set aside for the development of modular housing factories because we don't have, a, we have not had a robust modular housing industry in the state of Oregon. And yet we know that factory built elements, whether it's a wall system or whether it's a whole unit, can be a way for us to get housing on the, on the ground much more quickly. And it is frankly the only thing I've been able to identify that would help us respond to a wildfire or other emergency more quickly in the future. So we put $20 million into, fa into factory development. As of this week, I can report to you, and I'm thrilled about this, that two, there's, it's going out in four $5 million grants Two of those grants are coming to Southern Oregon, one to a factory in Klamath Falls, one to a factory in Phoenix, Oregon. Um, and we hope that those um, grants will help them to further develop um, their industry so that we can actually have a robust modular industry um, on the ground. And then the, the last thing in, in, in the innovation category that I wanted to mention is I also started thinking about, in, in the same vein of how do we use buildings differently, I started thinking about the commercial buildings that post-pandemic are very underutilized in many communities. And so we passed legislation in the 2023 session that will allow commercial buildings to be transitioned to residential buildings by right. You don't have to go through a planning process. That's not all, always easy and it's not cheap in many cases. But it is the right thing to do, and we need to, it's in that category of thinking differently about what resources are available to us and how we need to put them to use. So here we are. Let me just say a word about what's going to happen in the short session, because today we're here, and tomorrow, Senator Golden and I are going home and packing and driving to Salem um, for a session that starts on Monday. Um, and we will be talking about more housing, because we have a we have done all of this work and we are not done. We have not solved the problems. Um, Governor Kotek is coming forward with a $500 million housing package that will include development of a housing production office to oversee the work and to work with cities. Um, it will expedite some planning decisions that are made at the local level. Um, and it will put a significant amount of money toward the development of infrastructure and financing mechanisms for um, middle income housing. That latter is a proposal that, for a revolving loan fund that I've been working on for a year and a half with a, with a number of partners. So we are going to have much more work um, keyed up in a, for a very short 35 day short session. So, th so takeaways. So all of this, we've reviewed the, the five years of experience where the state has really been involved um, we know our local communities are stepping up. We hope the federal government continues to reinvest and re-understand um, its role in housing. But what are the takeaways that I would, that I hope you leave with here today? And there are two. The first is that appropriate and sustained services can turn the tide of homelessness. I think we are living in times when people give up hope much too quickly in many cases. And yet, we know that if we have the right services, and they won't be cheap, and this doesn't happen overnight, that we can help people successfully transition from a state of desperation to a state of stability and hope. And that's what we need to do. And second takeaway is it's housing, 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 because we've got to get people in the front door. We've got to extend the compassionate um, hand and the tangible services that will help them. And then we've got to have a place for them to move when they are ready. And that is all about building housing. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to share my perspective on the work that we've got going on at the state. I just want to finish 
by noting that it is everybody in this room um, who is going to make a difference here. What, whatever you're doing, some of you are serving meals on a regular basis, some of you are working at shelters, some of you are raising money, some of you are maybe contemplating what your move into this world is gonna be. Um, we will not go forward without your efforts, and I thank you for whatever pathway you choose to take. Thank you. Now that was a deserved standing ovation. I, uh, I wish it had come after my speech instead of before it, but never mind. Uh, actually, it relates to uh, my, why I um, am honored to be here today. Dennis called me last week and asked when he saw that I was coming if, I, uh, if I'd make some remarks, and I said, sure. And, he said, well, th how about 10 minutes or so? And I said, how about two or three minutes? Because, uh, you know, Pam, who I knew was on the program, has been so much more engaged in these programs than I do. She's the expert. We have 90 legislators in Salem. And when it comes to housing and homelessness and innovation, she is the best that we've got. So, so I... Uh, I thought, so yeah, I'll spend a couple minutes just expressing my gratitude and thanking the folks here for the incredible work, the way you've put us in leadership statewide on these issues. This is the reason Aura got the first project turnkey facility, like Pam was saying. And uh, just say, you know, let's keep going, keep, keep on going and, and do more together and sit down. And then I, Dennis said, that's fine. And then I started kind of percolating on it as if there's any value I could add. And I called him back and he said, let's make that, I said, let's make that two or three minutes, 10 minutes after all. So I'm gonna to try to keep to that. And um, you know, there's a lot that we, first of all, I wanna say how energizing it is to be here among so much experience and dedication and innovation and creativity and collaboration. And we are known for that statewide. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, people have been at the plow a long time, and people who are just now getting involved, in, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting with a group of friends, and uh, homelessness came up in our community, and people were expressing tremendous kind of sadness and compassion, and sort of saying, well, you know, how can we plug in, what can we do? And I mentioned today's events, and I'm proud to say that several of them are at a table right there to see how they can plug into all this. So that, that keeps growing, and your enthusiasm and excitement brings more of that in. And we don't have to, this is a group where we don't have, to, Pam and I don't have to do what we often do in general groups, which is talk about, I think the word these days is intersectionality of these issues, of housing and difficulty accessing um, adequate education and difficult, difficulty getting kids to school ready to learn. And of course, mental health and substance abuse, how that all comes together and we have to work on it all together. People here already know that. But there's another realm of um, issues and dynamics that we don't talk as much about because it's less comfortable to talk about it. And I. I want to bring them up, and it's less comfortable because while I would venture just about everybody in this room agrees with what they've heard already, pretty much, and will agree with most of what we hear today, it's all good work, there are other issues, I might even call them the roots of the roots of the problem, where we don't agree, and it leads to political discomfort and difficulties. And I want to, I want to call some of that out not because I like bringing anybody down, but because I think if we don't want to be coming back here into this room in 10 and 20 years and having this problem be as big or bigger than it is today, we have to start talking about them. So rather than be abstract, let me list three examples of, of things that I think we need, need to be thinking about, even beyond the getting upstream approaches that are so important that so many of you are involved with. 
The first is the MID. MID stands for Mortgage Interest Deduction, and it's been a subject of our work in the legislature since I've been there, I think even before. Every bill there, is, every year, there's been some kind of bill that looks at the deduction that people take on their home mortgage, on their property mortgage, which is, it's not something Oregon does on itself. We just reflect the federal tax code on that. And it, it became clear that until recently, these great big investments that Pam talked about, the single biggest expenditure of Oregon taxpayer dollars for housing was the deduction that we give on home mortgage interest. And we had to ask ourselves as a policy, is that where we should be putting most of our housing dollars? So there's, there's never been a proposal to eliminate the home mortgage in, interest deduction altogether. First of all, the federal one will continue no matter what we do. But there were a variety of proposals, and the most recent one that actually passed through the Housing Committee said this, we will no longer offer in Oregon that deduction on interest for second, third, fourth, or fifth homes. It's just only principal <laughs> residences. Now, I'll, I'll add there that if you have multiple homes and you're renting them out, you can deduct that interest as a business expense still, but not as a mortgage uh, interest deduction. And then it also said for your primary residence, your deduction starts going down uh, once you're at $200,000 uh, household income, and it goes away altogether over $250,000 household income, okay? So, and then that money would be dedicated to some form of our housing effort, either first-time ho home buyer support, any number of things. Finally, that got out of committee, but every time it's come up, I have been visited by delegations of, because I, I was co-sponsor, of uh, realtors who said to me, you have got to be kidding. This is part of the Oregon way of life and the American way of life. Let me hesitate to say that I know a lot of realtors in Ashland and Medford, and among them are the most generous and community-minded people I know. But this has just been an article. It's like Moses brought it down from the mountain on a tablet or something. This is, we're sort of entitled to this. I've used it myself, haven't minded using it. But this is an area where we have to start thinking differently, in my view. Where are we putting our taxpayer dollars? That's number one, the mid. And it's, the last, it's not the last you'll hear about it. The other is legislation we passed, I believe, in 2021. It's com complex, but bottom line, it requires that in residential zones that cities allow multi-unit development. Now, it's tiered. It depends on the size of the city. But that an owner's, nobody's mandating anything, but a property owner in a residential zone, unless there are particular problems with the property, has to be permitted to build duplexes, triplexes, sort of village clusters, and in bigger cities, it, there's details to it, but that's the essence of it. Many of my colleagues who really care about this issue, who represent more affluent districts, had a lot of trouble supporting this, if they could at all, because they have constituents who said to them, I don't want that in my neighborhood, in my nice, nicely shaded area with my big lots. That's not why I moved, what I moved here for. And I'm going to tell you that I can resonate with that because I remember in the 1980s, I live on Oak Street on the north end of town, being part of a neighborhood group that went to the city council pleading with them to turn down an application to build, I think it was 25 units on a five-acre piece across the street for us. It didn't, it didn't get built. But that was NIMBY. I didn't want to see those people in all my in, all, in my neighborhood. And I would suggest that before we point the finger at others completely, uh, all of us who are fortunate enough to live in those kinds of neighborhoods uh, look in the mirror. And that's another way we have to do things differently. <clears throat> I, I won't, you won't be seeing me at another city council meeting opposing multi-unit development. Um, and finally, and maybe most difficult, is the fact that residential real estate 
has become one of the hottest commodities for speculation in this country by hedge funds, by um, uh, equity firms, and by individuals. And uh, lest, lest I sound like I'm you know, demonizing somebody about this, any of us who have sort of general mutual funds, maybe in our retirement and our IRAs, it's quite likely and you're, you're benefiting from this dynamic as well. This is not the bad guys we have to go after. It's an embedded part of our economy right now. We found that out, um, you know, this is largely uh, a, an outgrowth of the 2008 housing crash where some of these very large firms whose names you might know swept up hundreds of thousands of millions of distressed units at bargain prices and are now themselves or who they sold to are driving the highest possible rents they can get. And that's a fact of life. Whether, whether folks mean well or not, that's a fact of life. The solution to that one, well, I do know the answer, but I see Dennis and I know I'm about done with my 10 minutes, so I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, um, there is no simple answer to that one, but it speaks to the necessity to reevaluate some of the real basics of the way our economy works. There are other advanced countries where this doesn't happen, so it's not impossible. So I wanted just to name some of the roots of the roots of our challenges and, in, in, and offer the hope that all of us become or stay really engaged in electoral politics and work for and support people who, and measures, who show awareness of these really difficult dynamics and a willingness to do something about it. And I do that so that it, when, when we come together in this room in 20 years, those of, of us who are still here, we can be talking about another challenge because we've made so much progress on this one. Thank you so much for all the work you do, Ora and the rest of you. Let's keep on keeping on. Thank you.